to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ whatever i command you be careful to observe it you shall not add to it nor take away from it deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32 welcome to our study of living messages of the old testament today we're going to be studying the book of deuteronomy as with our previous lessons, we want to look at each book concerning the context that it falls in, familiarize ourselves with the teaching of it. But just as important, we also want to see some living applications, some living messages for Christians today from the old law, and then again, see Jesus in the book of Deuteronomy. As you think about the book of Deuteronomy, this word means law again or second law. God gave the law to the first generation. They wandered in the wilderness and their bodies perished there. And so now this second generation has arisen and God is going to repeat that law to them, give them a law again so that they can be faithful to it so they'll know which direction to go and how to please them. Deuteronomy breaks into three unique categories, chapters 1 through 4. We have a historical section where some of the events of Israel's history are repeated. Chapters 5 through 26 is legislative in that God is giving the law. And then chapters 27 through 34 is kind of a prophetic section where God makes prophecies concerning Israel, their future, their hope, if they'll be faithful unto Him. As we think about some of the living messages, one that stands out for us initially in this book is that we as God's people, just as Israel should not, so we today should not change the Word of God. Two passages illustrate this for us from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 says this, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Here's God's initial uh, encouragement to the people, challenge to the people. Don't add to it. Don't take from the word of God, implying that God gave them exactly everything that they need. We today also have everything we need. Remember 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's Word supplies everything we need. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. The Scripture says that God's Word is full. Psalm 119 verse 130 or 160 says the entirety of God's Word is truth. But now I want you to notice that second passage along these same lines, Deuteronomy chapter 12, and look at what verse 32 says. God says, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Not only do we have the admonition to not take away, not add to, here God says, you be careful to do it. Friend, God wants us just simply to obey Him. I love the words of the mother of Jesus, Mary, in John chapter 2. The background and the setting is the wedding of Cana. And the, the crowd, the uh, wedding has run out of drink, and so uh, Mary requests of Jesus that He refill the pots. He has not performed a miracle yet. He, he, initially agree, he eventually agrees to do that. And in John chapter 2, verse 5, His mother, once she realizes He's going to do it, turns to the servants and says this, Whatever... He says to you, do it. Can you find better advice than that? Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. 
Oh, how we need to obey Jesus, the author of eternal salvation. We don't need to go beyond which is written, that which is written, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. We don't need to add to or take away from the Word of God either, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. We simply need to submit to and obey the will of God. You know, when we think about obedience, hasn't that always been what God wanted? Where did Adam and Eve go wrong? In the Garden of Eden, they disobeyed God. Moses disobeyed God when he struck the rock and instead of speaking to it. And as you look throughout history, the challenges and the difficulties that were faced were by people who did not obey the will of God. Secondly, from Deuteronomy, we also see a great admonition to parents. I love the words of Deuteronomy 6. It offers courage and hope and gives the challenge to parents to be godly parents. Notice these words. The Bible says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Here you've got that you shall love the Lord your God statement, the great statement of all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jesus added in Mark 12, verse 30 following. But then he says, and I want you to write these words everywhere. I want you to teach them to your children. I want you to get them before you. Get it where you can see it, where your family can see it. Make it an active part of your life. You know, as God encourages Israel to get the word before them, how parents today need that same encouragement. Parents, train up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Parents need to make every opportunity possible to teach their children the Bible. You need to have Bible study at home. You need to gather around and learn the Bible together. Don't you remember Paul's encouragement to the young evangelist Timothy? Paul said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, Ezra was a great man of God because he set his heart to learn the law of God, to do it, and to teach its statutes and judgments in all Israel. John the Baptist had a head start above many because of Luke chapter 1, verse 6. It says, both his parents were righteous in all their actions. Here's a godly family, and look what John the Immerser did. And so an admonition, admonition to parents, be the kind of godly parents you need to be. Think about the words of Acts 17, 11. That noble group in Berea, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What did they do when Paul came and brought a message? Paul comes to the door, they, they answer the door. Did they shut it in his face? No. They received the word with all readiness. What's that mean? They said, Paul, come in and sit down. They sat down. Paul sat down. Paul gives a spill about Jesus and they say, well, Paul, we've heard what you said. We appreciate you coming. Now we're going to check what you've said by the book. Friend, that's the kind of families, that's the kind of parents God wants today who will put the Word of God out before their children, help them to grow, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 2 Peter 3 verse 18, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. And then we come to three familiar verses for their use in the New Testament by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, Jesus is now taken and tempted by Satan. He's tempted with the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, lust of the flesh pride of life. Jesus has been hungry if you're the Son of God turn these stones to bread, takes him up on the high pinnacle, all these things I'll give you, uh, cast yourself down, God said he'd take care of you. He throws everything he can at him. Well, how did Jesus deal with that? He went back to the Word of God and he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Well, notice what Jesus used in overcoming Satan. Deuteronomy 6 verse 13, 
verse 16 and chapter 8, verse 3. Notice these words. Chapter 6, verse 13, Jesus used and said, You shall feel, fear the Lord your God and serve Him and shall take oaths in His name. Chapter 6, verse 16, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted Him in Massa. And then chapter 8 and verse 3, So He humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that He might make known to you that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said, I'm not going to give in because the Scripture says we're not to tempt God. I'm not going to give in because the Scripture says man doesn't have to live by word, by bread alone but by every word from God. And so what do I learn from passages like these, from the example of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? Friends, here's a real practical lesson. If when temptation comes, I know the Word of God well enough, I have in my, in my arsenal a litany of tools that will help me to overcome Satan's snares. Think about Psalm 119. Verses 10 through 12. How shall a young man cleanse his heart? By taking heed according to your word. Listen, your word I've hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. If we've got the word of God in here, if we're filled with it, if we are consumed by its teaching, if we love its laws and precepts and we want to do what God says, when Satan does throw something at us, Ephesians 6 teaches we have that shield of the faith. We have that sword of the Spirit to fend it off. And thus, we must know the Word of God like our Lord and Savior did. Well, isn't that really what God requires of us? What, what does the Lord require of people today? Deuteronomy 10 verses 12 and 13 tells us. Notice these words. The Bible says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes, which I command you today for your good. Not only were these for the people's benefit, here's what God wants, to walk faithfully, to love God, to follow His precepts. What is it that God really asks of me and you? Why are we here? What's life all about? We're here to serve God and to glorify Him. Isaiah said in Isaiah 43 and verse 7, God speaking through Isaiah said, Everyone who's called by my name, whom I created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. Not only is that a great passage about God as our Creator, but it tells us why we're here. We were created for God's glory. Paul said whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. In fact, what's the meaning of life all about? The Bible teaches that in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 and 14. Solomon had tried it all. He would tried finding achievement in building things, in pleasure and lust of the flesh, wine and women and the such like. And then he came to this final conclusion. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about? Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. My responsibility and yours is to obey God. Matthew 7, 21 is to love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark 12, 30 following. And to live our lives every day faithful unto the Lord. Now, from Deuteronomy we also see a beautiful picture of Jesus taking upon Himself the curse of the cross. I want you to look at the words of Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. Notice what the Scripture here says. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree. You shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now notice this. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. If someone had committed some heinous sin, 
some heinous crime and the punishment was hanging, that person was viewed as being cursed by God. Anyone who had done something that bad, that they deserved to be hung, God's vengeance was being taken out on that person. Well, haven't all of us sinned? Haven't all of us fallen short? Don't we all deserve to be lost and to receive the vengeance of God because of our sin? Shouldn't we all, in essence, be hanged? But think about it. Jesus took that curse of the cross for us. Look in Galatians 3 verse 13 and notice what the text says. The Bible says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of a law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. He's redeemed us. He saved us. Christ took it upon Himself. 1 Peter 2.24, He Himself bore in His own body our sins upon the tree. When Jesus went to Calvary, He bore the sins of the world. I think of the words of 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus is that great sin offering. And so as I think about passages like these, I'm reminded of God's great love and care for each and every one of us. You know, from the book of Deuteronomy, we also learn teaching on God's law concerning divorce. Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 through 4, If a woman had committed an uncleanliness, a sin, her husband was permitted by the law of Moses to give her a certificate of divorce and put her away, but he wasn't to take her back. Many believe that uncleanliness was something sexual. But as we look to the new law, we know exactly God's teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Friend, hear me carefully. God does not have 101 reasons for divorce, marriage, and remarriage. There is but one reason for divorce. And Jesus made it crystal clear in Matthew 19, 9. I want you to look at what the Scripture says. This is one of those passages that you need help to misunderstand. Look in Matthew 19, verse 9. Here's what the Scripture says. Jesus said, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, and here's the exception, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. What did Jesus teach? Fornication, sexual immorality. The Greek word is pornea, illicit sexual actions. The only licensed sexual action is found in Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And so that relationship is designed for marriage only. Anything outside of one man, one woman having that relationship, that's not God's law. And thus, when someone violates that, say a husband and wife are married, and the husband commits adultery, has relations with another woman, that woman has a right to divorce her husband except for sexual morality. She may divorce him and marry another. But if two people are married, and let's say they just divorce for incompatibility, they just can't get along, they fight all the time, what may they do? Friend, they're still bound. They cannot remarry. They did not divorce for fornication and thus they do not have the right to remarry. But what about the person who divorces his spouse for sexual immorality? What about the spouse? Whoever marries her commits adultery. She's not licensed to marry. She doesn't have that right. And so what's God's law? God's original law is Genesis 2.24. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The exception is for sexual immorality, and that's the only exception. Does death end marriage? Absolutely. Romans 7, 1 through 4 teaches that it does, but there's only one reason for divorce, and that's fornication. And friends, we need to be sure there are going to be multitudes of people on the day of judgment who are going to spend eternity in a devil's hell because they have not obeyed God's law on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. You cannot. Uh, ignore the law of God and Christ's teaching and think that somehow on the day of judgment everything's going to be okay. God is clear on this subject and thus if a person finds themselves in a situation that's not right, like in Ezra 9 and 10, 
If two people find out they're married and their marriage is not what it ought to be, they're not scripturally married, they don't have a right to be married, what must they do? They must separate and remain single, live a faithful life to God, and focus on heaven, not the flesh, and not the lust of the flesh. Another powerful lesson that we learn from the book of Deuteronomy deals with how to figure out a false prophet. Deuteronomy chapter 18, I want you to notice what the scripture teaches concerning false prophets. Here's what the Bible says in verse 22. God said, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Or what's the litmus test we might say? If he says it, God says, and it doesn't happen, God says he's not speaking for me. Now you think about the people who have said that. Harold Camping said a while back that the end of the earth was going to happen on such and such day just recently. Did that happen? Of course not. Thus, I'm not to believe anything he says. Joseph Smith made a host of prophecies. Mary Eddie Baker, Rutherford Hayes, a host of people have come through the centuries. They know when the Lord's coming. This is going to happen on this day. And it never happens. What can we know about those people? Friend, they're not speaking for God. Here's what we do know. God has in these last days spoken through His Son. I don't have to worry about looking for a latter-day prophet. I've got everything I need right here in the book. God has given His will, and we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt what that will is. You know, another lesson that we learn from the book of Deuteronomy is that there are just some things that God has not fully revealed to us. There's, I believe, and as the Bible teaches, we've been thoroughly equipped for every good work, have everything we need for life and godliness, but we don't have all the answers to all the questions. But we do have everything we need in God's Word. Notice Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The Scripture says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. You know, there are people who have questions. What did Jesus write in the sand? Who did Moses marry? And there may be various questions that we'll never fully have the answer to. But here's what we do know. Right here in this book, this is what God has revealed to us, and this is ours. We can know it, we can live by it, and you can be sure. Here's the good news. If you obey this book, you can be sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to go to heaven. The Scripture says in 2 Timothy 2.15 that we each have the responsibility to study to show ourselves and prove unto God a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says this book has everything for life and godliness, and you can know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Are there some things we don't have answers to? Sure. But do I have everything I need to get to heaven? Absolutely. Everything to live the best life and go to heaven is right here in this book. And so we must take advantage of obeying that. Thus, we must know the Word of God. I want you to look at what Deuteronomy says about making sure that we know the Word of God, that we have an active knowledge of it, and that we're living by that. Look in Deuteronomy 31, verses 12 and 13. The Scripture says, God said, Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. And so here God says, I want you to know it and I want your children to know it and I want, to, I want you to give yourself to that word. Again, we remind you of the words of Acts 17, 11. They searched the scriptures daily to see if what they were being told is true to the will of God. Now Deuteronomy, although it started out on a high note, re-giving the law, ends with the death of Moses. Deuteronomy 34 verse 34, Moses stands on Mount Pigza and there he looks over into the great Canaan land and God only knows where his body is hid. God took care of Moses up to that very point 
And He's going to take care of us. He's promised us. Not only can we have a, a, a visual of that heavenly place that God's written about in His Word, but we can each one enter there if we'll be faithful to Him. God reiterated His law to the people of Israel. And friends, we have a law today, and it's the law of Christ. We ask you, have you obeyed God's law? Are, are you sure that you're living right as a Christian? If you're not a Christian, why not become one today? God didn't confuse us. God makes it simple and He makes it plain on what one must do to become a Christian. You have to hear the Word of God today. If you'll hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Hebrews 3 verse 7. Have you heard the Word of God? I know hearing is essential for Hebrews 11 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. How do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If it's impossible to please God without faith, and the only way I can get faith is by hearing the Word of God, then I need to hear God's Word so that I can believe in Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road. You remember the story, he comes to a certain water. Here's water, what doth hinder me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is God's Son? Are you willing to change your life? Acts 3 verse 19, repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Would you make that great confession before men? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 10, Acts chapter 8 verse 36 and 37. And would you be immersed in water? for the forgiveness of your sins. Friend, you may say, well, I've done all those things, but I've never been immersed. I've never been baptized. Uh, does the Bible teach that's essential? Absolutely it does. Think about the words of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Galatians 3, 27, Paul said, as many of us as were baptized into Christ, have clothed ourselves with Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Salvation is in Christ. 2 Timothy 2 verses 10 and 11. And thus, if I'm baptized into Christ, and that's where salvation and all spiritual blessings are, then it's essential for salvation. And so our prayer and our hope today is that if you've not obeyed the gospel, that you'll do that, that you'll become a Christian. If as a Christian, maybe your life's not been lived faithfully. Friend, there's no time like the present. If you've not been living faithful to the Lord, won't you do it today? Won't you obey the gospel and live for Christ before it's too late? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.